Hi everyone. I presented to the school I retired from the other day about some um, considerations around retiring from Colorado Para. Some thoughts since I went ahead and created all the slides, maybe I just would record one to post online because it's pretty common to all folks in Colorado Para, all teachers in Colorado Para, not just the folks in my prior district. So um, I'm going to do a pretty high level overview of this. Um, really important caveats at the beginning. I'm not a financial advisor. Um, I have no formal qualifications um, for this. I don't have any initials after my name. Um, I do feel like I, I know a fair amount and that nothing I'm saying here is that controversial or, or is incorrect. But again, as always, use your best judgment. Um, these are the kind of five areas I'm going to cover again at a very high level. Um, we're going to go reasonably fast here because you can pause and replay if you need to. Um, and please feel free to reach out. Um, I'll include my email address at the end. I'll also include a link to these slides in the show notes. Um, and then don't, and you can always reach out to me, but also don't be afraid to reach out to Para. They're very, very helpful and they are um, more knowledgeable than I am. So they're great folks to ask questions. So these are the five areas that I'm going to kind of cover again at kind of a high level. So first, how your para benefit is calculated. This is important to know. Um, within this topic, there's these five things I'm going to talk about. Starting with your HAS table. And HAS stands for highest average salary. Um, and it's really important to know which table you are in for your retirement. And that is based on your membership and your vesting dates. Again, the slides, there's a hyperlink for this, but it takes you to this page uh, that I'm showing you a little bit of here where it indicates based on your membership date, when you vested, had five years of service, and when you're eligible for retirement, which table you use. And again, very important because that table determines what combination of age and service credit you need to retire with either a full benefit or a reduced benefit. And when you open up one of those tables, for example, here's para table two, which is um, for folks who have been around for a while, um, like myself. Um, it's important to understand how to read these tables. So across the top is your age at retirement and across the and going down the side is your years of service credit. And you'll kind of see three main areas. You'll see a blank white area where it says no retirement benefits payable. So for example, if you retired at age 56 with 13 years of service, you do not you are not eligible to receive uh, in table two a benefit at that time. Now, if you wait until you age 60, then you would then, with that same level of service, you would get a benefit, but for those years in between, you would not. Then there's the green shaded areas, and the green shaded areas are reduced retirement benefits. So that's a, gonna be a lower percentage than what the formula calculates for your retirement benefits. And then the area with a white background, um, but numbers in, um, is full retirement. That's your, the full benefit as calculated by Paris formula. So really important to know when you're eligible to retire and whether it's reduced or whether it is um, full retirement. And of course, you can choose to retire in that blank white area. It's just that you're going to have to wait to receive a benefit. So how is your highest average salary, your HAS, calculated? Um, again, depends a little bit on when you joined PARA, in this case, when you were vested. So if you had five years before January 1st, 2020, then your HAS is based on the highest of your, your three highest years. It's an average of those three years. If you did not vest before then, it's your five highest years. And technically they're not years, they're 12 consecutive months. So PARA looks at every 12 consecutive month period in your entire work history under PARA and picks the um, three or five highest 12 consecutive months. Does not have to be your last three years or five years, although for most folks it is. Another important thing to keep in mind with your highest average salary calculation is section 125 um, contributions or, um, from your paycheck. So section 125 are things like paying your health and dental insurance premiums pre-tax, um, contributing to a dependent care spending account for daycare or a flexible spending account. If your membership with PARA was before June 30th, 2019, those all come out pre-PARA. So not just pre-tax, but pre-PARA contribution, which is great because that's an even bigger break for you. 
But then you do have to be aware that if you don't stop doing that during your HAS years, it'll lower your highest average salary, which will lower your para benefit in retirement. So most folks should stop doing the Section 125 contributions pre-tax um, during the, their HAS years. And finally, um, this is true for most pension systems, you want to think about um, optimizing your pay during those three or five years because that is what indeed what your benefit is based on. So that could include things like um, making sure you're um, as far advanced as you can on the salary schedule in terms of education level. Could even be um, <clears throat> moving up to administration if you've been a teacher. Um, it could be taking on extra duties like coaching or activities or taking tickets at the soccer game. Um, all of those will boost your pay and give you extra money during those years, but then extra money for the rest of your life through your benefit. Um, as previously mentioned, make sure you stop doing Section 125 if you are vested, um, I'm, I'm sorry, if your membership was before June 30th, 2019. If it wasn't, you don't need to stop that. And then some districts at least have a sick leave payout. Um, that is now considered a para-includable salary, and it actually gets counted as an additional month. So if you have a decent amount that, that qualifies you, you will actually get one more month of service credit for your benefit. So for example, if you had 30 years teaching, um, you would actually get a benefit based on 30 years in one month because of that sick leave payout. And if that sick leave payout is high enough, it could actually increase your HAS. Um, one thing to keep in mind that is there are provisions in PARA's laws, rules, to um, prevent spiking. So you're, you are limited to an 8% increase from year to year to be counted for your HAS. So if you had a huge increase um, anytime in those last three or five years, it would be limited to 8% for the HAS calculation. Okay, next part to know about after your um, which table you use and um, what your highest average salary is calculated on is years of service. So this is a big part of the formula. And there's three or four different areas to think about here. Um, the majority of this is likely to be earned service. So every year you work, um, you get a full year of para service credit. Um, you also can often purchase service credit, which we'll talk more about in a minute. Um, as I just mentioned, uh, sick leave payout might get you another month. And then for districts that offer a transition year, which we'll also talk about, um, that actually can take away a year of service, um, and we'll talk more about that. So the Bennett for formula for a full retirement at PARA is your years of service times 2.5% times your highest average salary. So for example, if you had 30 years of service, 30 times 2.5 is 75%, you would get a benefit equal to 75% of your highest average salary. So again, the average of your last three or five years. That's if you qualify for a full retirement. But again, if you retire in those green shaded cells in your HAS table, it'll be an early retirement reduction. And instead of using that formula, you'll have to look at the percent that's actually in that green shaded cell, which will be less than what it would be if you just multiply by 2.5% because you're retiring what's considered early. So therefore you're going to be getting a benefit longer. So that benefit is going to be lower. It's also important to understand that that formula is for an option one retirement. Um, PARA offers three different options for retirement, and option one is what the formula calculates. And what that option does is you get a benefit, and it's the, the maximum benefit you can get. Um, but when you die, that benefit does not continue on to your beneficiary. Um, there is a, a small exception to that, which is if you die fairly quickly after retiring and you have not, PARA has not paid out more than what you have contributed plus the interest on it then your beneficiary will get a small lump sum, but that usually doesn't take very many years for that to happen. Um, and the important thing to remember is that when you die, that check stops and no longer keeps coming to your beneficiary. Because of that, they offer two other options. Option two is a smaller monthly amount than the option one, which is based on the formula. And But if you die before your beneficiary, then your beneficiary will consider, continue to get 50% of your check for their lifetime. And option three is reduced a little bit more, um, but if you die before your beneficiary, your beneficiary will continue to get 100%. Your check will not change. It will continue to go to your beneficiary for their lifetime. Now, keep in mind for both for option two and option three, if your beneficiary 
dies before you, so predeceases you, then your benefit will then pop back up to the option one level because they're no longer responsible for worrying about your um, beneficiary's life expectancy. Um, just an example, this is really small, but it is hyperlinked from the slides. Here is a table of the option three factors. So for example, over there on the right, you can kind of see a blue box, really, really small, that if you are age 58, which is retiree age is down the left-hand side, beneficiary age is across the top. So if you're 58 and your beneficiary is 59 at the time of your retirement, if you find where those that row and column intersects, you see a factor of 0.911594. That is what you would multiply the, the formula by to get your benefit. So you'd be getting a slightly more than 91% of your option one benefit. But again, keep in mind, this is for option three. So therefore, if you die first, then your beneficiary continues to get that amount um, after you die. All right, so after earning service credit, a lot of people may not be aware that they might be able to purchase service credit. Um, again, there's a nice publication by Para that is linked from the slides that you can take a look at. Um, but I'm going to talk about these five areas um, fairly quickly because, uh, again, it's, it, it gets very, you know, like all personal finance, it's personal. So you, you need to dive into the details. So first, what qualifies? Three main areas. Um, if you worked for Para and then stopped working for Para and chose to refund your service, so take your money out, you can buy those years back. And those are actually the cheapest years to buy back. Um, that doesn't apply to a lot of people, but if it does apply to you, definitely something to look at. The second area is qualified and non-qualified service. So qualified service... Um, again, the definition is, is detailed, but basically it's, it's public service, often teaching in another state or teaching in a private school or working for another public employer. Um, you can buy those years in para as long as you're not receiving a benefit from that other pension plan. So let's say you taught for three years in Wyoming and then moved to Colorado and you pull your money out of Wyoming, so you're not getting a benefit from them, then you could buy those three years as qualified service. Non-qualified service is basically anything else. So anything that is, where you work, where you are um, covered by Social Security, um, you can buy those years as well, as long as it's not concurrent with your para service. So it's not Social Security you earn while you're also teaching, but for, for you know, a, a job you worked in high school or college or maybe before you um, started teaching, that can all qualify to purchase the service. And then this is pretty rare these days, but if you um, took a sabbatical leave where you, you and your district were um, still contributing to that, you can, you can purchase some years there. So how much and when you can purchase, again, varies based on your membership date. If your membership date is before January 1st, 1999, then you only need one year of earned service credit before you can purchase um, your years, and you can purchase up to 10 total years of qualified or non-qualified employment in any combination that goes up to 10 years. If your membership is on or after January 1st, 1999, then after one year of service credit, you can purchase up to 10 years of qualified employment. <clears throat> Excuse me. But you can't purchase non-qualified employment until you have five years of earned service credit, and you can only purchase up to five years of non-qualified. So you can still purchase up to 10 years total, but that can either be 10 years of qualified or five years of qualified or five years of non-qualified. The cost of purchasing. Um, purchasing service credit is not cheap. It, it does cost a lot of money because it has to, you know, the, the program has to be funded. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on rolled over and refunded, but again, you can look into that if you want. But for employment not covered by PARA, either qualified or non-qualified, it's going to be an actuarial cost based on your highest average salary, your current at the time that you purchase, your age, and your membership date. Again, you can look at that publication 5-52, or it's much easier just to simply log into the calculator on the PARA website, um, and it has all your information, and it'll tell you exactly what it would cost to purchase years right now. Um, so let's talk a little bit about pros and cons of purchasing. I'm going to start with the negatives. Um, you know, picture a scenario where you have $100,000 in your 401k, and that would allow you to buy four years at Para. And so your your choice is: Do I keep that $100,000 in the 401k, or do I pull it out to buy four years of Para? And really, it's a it's a 
debate between um, having a, a lump sum of money, you're trading a lump sum of money for guaranteed income for life. So we're going to talk about that. Um, and so the con is that if you don't buy the years and that 100,000 could grow tremendously, right? You could get lucky with your investments, the markets could be kind and you could grow that um, money at a faster rate than what's assumed in your and what the calculation that gives you your pair of benefit. Um, that is a possibility. Um, second is uh, you have more flexibility in retirement to make a lump sum purchase. So again, let's say you retired and you really want to buy a boat that costs $60,000. Well, if you have $100,000 in your 401k, you can just write a check for it. Whereas if you're getting an extra $400 a month from Para, then you have to come up with something else. So it does give you a little bit more flexibility. Um, you possibly could leave a greater legacy, either to your spouse or to your inheritance, to your kids or, or someone else. Um, the para benefit, if it's option one, it stops when you die. If it's option two or three, it stops when your beneficiary, which is typically, but not always, a spouse dies. Um, whereas that 100000 that's in the 401k and whatever it grows into, if you don't spend it down, then that is all left for your spouse or an inheritance. And the last con for some folks is you do have to come up with the money. So in the example I gave where you know maybe it costs $100,000 to buy those four years, you have to have that $100,000 somewhere in order to do it. Um, but now let's shift to the pros. And you'll notice there's a few more pros and, and this kind of plays into my bias that I think not for everyone, but for most people um, who, who have the money available, it, it does make sense to purchase years. So I'm more on the pro side, more often on the pro side than the con side for most people. Again, individual um, circumstances vary. So um, that might not be true for you. So the first pro of purchasing is you might be able to retire earlier and or eliminate the early retirement reduction. So again, when we looked at that has table, um, you know, every year you purchase moves you down a cell on that table because down the left hand side was your years of service. So it might move you from that blank white area where you don't get any benefit into a green area where you can take an early retirement or from a green to the white area where the um, percentage is the full retirement benefit. So that is is really nice. Um, being able to, to retire earlier, either just because you're ready to retire or because of health reasons or other reasons is a, is a nice thing. Um, by buying years, your para defined benefit will be larger. Again, the formula is 2.5% times each year of service. For every year of service you buy, therefore, you'll get another 2.5%. So if you buy four years, your benefit will be 10% larger. Um, now that is a that is the option one benefit is 10% larger. When you factor in the option two and three factors, it would be slightly less than that because of the reduced amount, but still significant. Um, the third, and this is really key, it is guaranteed income for life. So we talked before about how that 100,000 in your 401k might grow faster than what Para is assuming. And in which case, you know, in retrospect, it would be a better deal. Um, but if it doesn't, either because you spend it, um, you know, you, you buy that boat, or because your investments don't do as well as you had hoped, um, that money can run out, right? You can spend down your 401k to zero and you have nothing left or to a, a small amount. Whereas for para, it is guaranteed income for life. You will continue to get that check until you die. And if you take option two or three, your um, beneficiary will continue to get that check until they die. So that is a, a really helpful thing. Um, in the non-pension world, this is what a lot of people are trying to figure out when they're trying to purchase an annuity. They're trying to turn their 401k and their IRAs into a monthly check. Um, the problem is they end up paying a lot more fees, whereas para is nonprofit, so we get it pretty good. The other thing about purchasing credit is you're shifting the investment risk from yourself to the state of Colorado. So at the time of this recording, the markets have done extremely well the last 10 years, and so you have a lot of gains that are higher than what you, what you would normally expect over a 10-year period. Um, once you, so if you cash in the gains you've made from your investments in your 401k, or as we'll talk about, it doesn't have to be in a, a tax-advantaged account right now to buy years, um, again, Para and the state of Colorado, well, the state of Colorado is guaranteeing that payment to you. So even if the markets don't do well, you are still going to get that check guaranteed for life. Um, again, the only way that wouldn't happen is if the state of Colorado defaulted on their debts, which is very, very unlikely. And if it did, it means we have much bigger problems. Um, and so you're lock, basically locking in the gains you've, you've received over the last 10 years and buying years 
um, and, and shifting it to guaranteed income for life. And you don't have to worry about investment risk in the future. Um, it's not going to go to zero. You can continue to get that check no matter what. Um, for some folks, it, buying years can also get you a slightly greater health care subsidy in retirement. So we'll talk about this in a little bit later. But Para offers Paracare, and it is partially subsidized. And the subsidy maxes out at 20 years of service credit. So if you were retiring, if say you had 18 years of earned service, and then you bought two more, then that would increase your subsidy. Now, once you hit 20, then the subsidy doesn't go up anymore. But that can be helpful for folks who, who have worked a relatively shorter career. And then last in this, in some respects, might be the most important, although the hardest to explain on a screencast like this, is the behavioral aspects. Um, so again, go back to 100,000 in the 401k. It's going to grow hopefully to something over your, you know, something larger over your retirement versus the increased um, monthly check from Para. It's great to have that $100,000 in um, in that 401k, but it's a tough thing behaviorally to spend that money because for most people, not everybody, but for most people, you do a lot of, you play a lot of what if. Well, what if I get sick and I have a lot of healthcare expenses? Or what if I need assisted living? Or what if, um, you know, something happens to the house and there's a, there's a big repair bill and those kind of things. So it's much more difficult for most people to pull money out of their 401k and spend it than it is to spend, let's say, an additional $300 a month in your paracheck. Because that $300 a month, you know you're going to get this month, and then you know you're going to get it next month, and the next month, and the next month, and so on, forever. So it's much, it's like getting a paycheck. You're much more likely, or much, yeah, much more likely to be comfortable spending that $300 because you know you're going to get another $300, another $300 the, the following month. Whereas when you pull it out of the 401k, it's gone and you don't know that you're necessarily going to get more money depending on how your investments do. So um, there's a huge behavioral aspect there um, that I think is, is underrated and, and underappreciated by a lot of folks. So that's why for me, that for, I'd say the majority of people, but it does mean everybody, um, purchasing credit makes more sense than keeping it in a 401k or IRA or brokerage account. Um, one last thing about purchasing, most people prefer to use pre-tax money, particularly if you already have it saved in a 401k, 403b, or traditional IRA. Um, note, you cannot use Roth money for this, but any pre-tax money you can use um, because it's already saved for retirement and it's hopefully available. And as I said, um, investment returns have been great over the last few years, so it, it may have grown fairly large. Um, but keep in mind, you don't have to have that money there. You can use post-tax money, which means that you can use what's in your savings and checking account. You can use what's in your taxable brokerage account. Um, you can use that money as well to purchase yours. It doesn't have to be pre-tax. And indeed, it can be a combination of the two. All right, so after purchasing years, let's talk about a transition year. Um, in some districts, these are referred to as 93-93 or 110-110 years. So let's talk about what this is and the pros and cons of it. So what a transition year is, is some districts allow you to do this. This is a district decision. Um, Para is fine with it, but some districts offer it, some don't, where you actually can retire from Para start receiving your pension, but work one more year for your school district, and so you continue to get paid. And the reason for that is because school districts, have, you know, calendar year are July to June, so half the year is in one calendar year, and sorry, school year is July to June, so half the year is in one calendar year, and half is in the other next calendar year, so you don't go over the number of days that is too much to work for a para employer while retired, so that's why you can do one year without this being a problem. Um, if you choose to do this, um, you do not earn service credit for that last year, that transition year, but you do still contribute to PARA, and as does your employer. And in some districts, and this definitely varies, but the district I retired from, Littleton Public Schools, during that transition year, you do not receive benefits. Um, your pay is frozen at the previous year's level, and you get limited sick days. So there are some things to uh, consider there, depending on how your district handles that. So it's really important to know those details. So let's talk about the pros of the transition year. And so when I first started teaching um, in Colorado, um, most people generally said transition year, yeah, if it's still around when you do it, this is a slam dunk. Why wouldn't you do this? 
Um, so here, here's why a lot of people think it's a slam dunk. I'm going to talk in a minute while I think it isn't a slam dunk. Um, it can be good, but not necessarily. So the first is that if you do a transition year, you get 14 months of a paycheck and a half plus um, because you get your salary plus your pension. Now, some people um, refer to this as, as a double dip year where you get twice your salary, but that's not the case because your pension is not going to equal your salary. So for most folks, it's somewhere in the order of 1.6 or 1.7. And it's 14 months um, for most people because if your school year ends in May, then your first para benefit is in the end of June, which means you get June, July, and then 12 more months of salary from your district. So that's 14 months while also getting your para pension. Um, during that year, it can allow for super savings, right? You get making 1.6, so you're making you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars more during that year than you have been used to. So you can plow that into a 401k or a 457 um, and, and really bulk up your savings right before retirement or pay down debt, which hopefully you've already done. Um, a, a last pro is more psychological. Um, if you declare a transition year with your district, you're committed to retiring. Now, technically, you can change your mind. If you retire with para and decide to go back to work, you can suspend your retirement with para, but it's a lot of work and it's a pain. Um, and so it, it's it, for a lot of people, it's a psychological decision of, okay, I've made the decision and, and now I'm done. So it's a, it's a way to, to uh, feel better about that. So all those are reasons why people said this is a slam dunk. Why wouldn't you, you know, that last year, why wouldn't you want to make one and a half to two times your salary, um, you know, for, for doing the same work? Well, here's why. So here are the cons. Um, in some ways, doing a transition year is the opposite of purchasing years. It's not a perfect analogy, but it's close. You lose that additional 2.5% of HAS that you would get for working that one year. So you're, you're doing the opposite of purchasing. You're trading additional monthly income for life for a lump sum now, which goes back to that behavior aspect. Um, second, in some districts like LPS, um, if you lose your benefits, that's significant. And the cost of health and dental insurance when you're paying for yourself uh, is going to be you know, five to $10,000 at least, unless you're lucky enough to, to have a spouse that has really great coverage um, for you. Um, you might lose, you'll, you'd lose your district life insurance. You wouldn't get the allocation of, of sick days for that year and personal days. Um, again, that varies on your district, but something to keep in mind. Um, again, in some districts, you forego any step in cost of living increase for that last year. So like an LPS, if you are at MA plus 90 with 30 years and you do a transition year, you don't move to step 31. You stay at step 30 and you also not only do you not move to the next step, but you don't get the cost of living increase that you get each year of 1% to 2%. That's an increase to the salary schedule itself. So you, you do make less from the district in that last year than you would have if you had not done a transition year. That then translates into a lower highest average salary. Um, again, if you, whether you're three years or five years, um, if you do a transition year, that last year doesn't count towards your highest average salary because you've already retired with para. It would be years four, three, and two before you retired, not counting your transition year. Whereas if you don't do a transition year, that's years three, two, and one. So in other words, you're, you're trading your salary that last year for the salary three years before that. Um, and depending on where you're on the salary scale and what's been happening in your district, that can be a significant enough difference that it, it could make a, a pretty big difference in your HAS. Rel I mean, not, not humongous, but um, certainly thousands and thousands of dollars difference, which then translates into um, an increased, or if you do the transition year, a decreased um, monthly benefit. Um, one last, again, psychological piece is that if you don't do a transition year, it is much easier to change your mind. So you get to, to January and you say, OK, you know what? I'm not ready to retire. Um, much easier to keep going because you presumably still have a job um, and, and you don't have to unretire from para. Um, on the other hand, as I said, that could be a pro that um, you, you because you don't want to change your mind. So, again, very, very individual, but. Uh, I would just caution you that everybody who thinks a transition year is just a no-brainer, I think it requires a lot more thinking. And again, 
maybe not as strongly as I believe the purchasing years is, is really good for almost everybody. Um, I think not doing a transition year is probably the right call for most people, but again, not everyone, depending on your individual situation. Um, again, that's something to, to look at all your circumstances and factors. And again, happy to, to talk that through with you if you want. Okay, another thing to think about as you're getting close to retirement is health insurance. Um, you know, intellectually, people know that their employer has been paying a lot for their health insurance, but most people don't really look that carefully to see how much they are paying. Um, and so you're, you know, like in little to public schools, um, they pay 92% of the premium for the employee. So you're only paying 8%. When you retire, and in Littleton, it's during that transition year, but, but whether it's trans, whether you get benefits for transition year or not, you, you definitely don't get benefits once you're retired. Um, suddenly, you're paying that on your own. And again, that's five to $10,000 a year just for you. Um, and then if you have dependents coverage, it could be more. So your options, I mean, there, there may be more, but these are the three main ones. If you have a spouse who's still working um, and getting benefits, you might be able to get on their benefits. Uh, but again, that's likely to be expensive. There aren't that many employers these days who pay a lot towards um, you know, your beneficiaries' uh, health insurance premiums, but you might be in that situation. Um, second, everyone who retires under para does have access to paracare. And again, you have that partial subsidy depending on the number of years of service you have. And that's a great option. Still not cheap, but it's a great option. Um, Right now, the cheaper option than Paracare for many folks will actually be through the ACA marketplace. Um, so this wasn't the case until um, the beginning of this year when, um, the, I can't remember the name of it, American Prosperity Act or, or whatever passed that increased the subsidy for the ACA. Um, before that, there was an income limitation that for a lot of folks with a, getting a pair retirement, they exceeded. So you weren't, the subsidy was, the, the cost without the subsidy was a, a bit more, not a lot, but a bit more than Paracare. But now with those additional higher subsidies, the ACA marketplace is actually lower than Paracare. So as an example, my, my family switched from Paracare to the ACA this past summer because of that change. Now that is a time-limited change in, in the Prosperity Act. Um, I think it was only good for 2021 and 2022. So if that gets extended, then we'll keep doing it. If it ends after 2022, we will switch back to Paracare. And you can switch back, you know, each year. They both start um, January 1st for the new plan year. So you can make that decision each fall. Um, there's a blog post listed here where I uh, talked the, about the comparison between Paracare and ACA for, for our particular coverage. Um, one more consideration is Social Security. So um, folks who pay into para, uh, almost everybody, and certainly teachers, don't pay into Social Security. There are a few jobs here and there under para where, where you do um, at the university level, I think, mostly. Um, so for Social Security, we need to talk about these um, three things. How do you qualify and how does um, para affect that? So first, how do you qualify? Again, lots of details here. But um, at, the, at the high level, you have to have 40 or more quarters, which is 10 years of covered earnings. So that's earnings where you paid into Social Security. Um, it's not a particularly high bar. Um, right now, it's 1,470 in a quarter gets you that quarter. And that number decreases the farther back you go. Um, the more quarters and the more earnings you have, then the larger your benefit will be. And you can um, find that out online. Log into your Social Security account and you can download the statement and it'll tell you how many quarters you have and list all your reported income. And you can have all the details right there. It'll also give you an estimate of your benefit, but that's where we need to talk a little bit more about how para affects your benefit. So the first thing you need to realize is that Social Security, any benefit you get from Social Security never affects your para benefit. Your para benefit is is what it is. Um, and if you get Social Security on top of that, para doesn't care. However, it doesn't go the other way around. So if you get a para benefit, um, then your Social Security benefit, if you qualify for one, that 40 quarters or more, will be reduced by something called the windfall elimination provision, um, usually referred to as WEP. Um, this can lower, but it can't eliminate your Social Security benefit. So the most it can lower is about 55%, so about 45% of, of what, the, what your statement would tell you. So it's important to know that Social Security statement you view online or download um, 
is not going to actually reflect, reflect your benefit because it will get reduced by the windfall elimination provision. Then there's a second provision which uh, applies you if you have a spouse who is getting Social Security and they um, predecease you, sometimes you might qualify for a spousal benefit if their Social Security benefit is higher than yours. However, the GPO, the government pension offset, will likely, if you have a fairly decent para benefit, wipe that out completely. So unlike the WEP, the GPO can wipe it out completely. So basically you take two thirds of your para benefit um, subtract that from your spouse's Social Security, and if that's less than zero, you get nothing. If it's more than zero, you could get something, but it's still going to be a very small amount. Um, again, I have some links there for you to explore those more, and then a blog post I wrote trying to talk about why this is the way it is, um, in case you want to learn a little bit more. So that was a lot of information. Um, but hopefully, because it's on video, you can stop and replay, and you can... Um, Check the link to these slides in the show notes underneath so that you can um, click any of the links you want or, or read the slides at your leisure. A um, couple ways to get a hold of me, <clears> or <throat> the main way to get a hold of me is email right there, carlfish at gmail.com. Um, two websites I run, um, one fish learning uh, is is I guess the business side where I've written some books and I offer some classes sometimes. Um, don't feel free to check that out. Um, the second one, Fish Financial, is simply blog posts I write. So the blog posts I've linked to are, are there where I offer some financial advice. And I, and I certainly are not in financial advice, financial education. Um, and um, I also do work with Colorado educators for free if you want to just have somebody kind of talk over some stuff with you. Um, but again, keep in mind, I'm not a financial planner. Um, and then I've linked uh, a book here. I've written some books about uh, pension plans and, and financial literacy. Here's the one for Colorado, since this is all about Colorado. Um, this is also hyperlinked from the slide deck. Um, and so you can find that on Amazon. Um, it, it, it goes more in depth about how you should be optimizing your finances throughout your adult life if you know you're getting a pair of benefit, not just thinking about it when you're getting close to retirement. Um, so again, um, please reach out to me if you have questions about this presentation or about anything. Um, you know, again, happy to answer questions about anything, including para. But if you have questions about para, they really are the best people to answer because they know more than I do. And, and, and their word is, is going to be 100% accurate, whereas mine's going to be maybe 98% accurate. And occasionally I'll get a nuance wrong. So um, please do that. Um, if you have any questions, again, just let me know. And I hope you find this helpful.